Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by Yuri Turin from Concept Angle. Yuri, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really Thank appreciate you. coming in and talking to us on the Dev Ready Podcast. And before we get into topic, let's talk a bit about who you are, your background, your history. Tell us a bit about your, your, yourself, Yuri. Well, I'm coming with from far end this planet. I've got wide geographical history. I was born in Germany, grew up in Russia, now living in Australia. And I'm running consultancy business, helping businesses to become more efficient. So my journey started 20, actually 20 years ago. This was actually, that's an interesting story because I'm very passionate about everything automotive related. And then when I just finished my school, I was on the way to the U- to uni just to lodge the documents and enter the uni. And I had no doubts that my career was going to be in automotive industry. And just on my way, I stopped at the intersection for a couple of minutes. And my destination was 50 meters just ahead of me. And the rest of the uni, all other faculties of all other directions were on the left. And suddenly I turned left and lodged all the documents and applied for the faculty of uh, process improvement, automation, and software development. Interesting. Why? <laughs> no, I still have no answer to this. It was okay. sign from heaven. I don't know. It was just a omen. Something like some invisible force made me turn left and go there, and I but, never regret it. But what was it about the automotive industry that you thought you would be working in? Well, I think at that point in time, I real, I have realized that I'm not ready to make money of it or do it for a living and spend at least a few years having half my arms in oils and grease <laughs> and all of that. And actually, that helped me to save my hobby because I still enjoy it. I still love to spend weekends under my four-wheel drive doing it all myself, and I enjoy it. And I know... If I was doing this for a living, I would hate it. <laughs> day day, yeah. There is a lot of a process-driven stuff in that industry as well. I thought maybe there was a connection and that's why you went that way. But yeah, that truly was a left turn. Yeah, well, that's actually, that's you touched that point, that industry has lots of processes. There is something I'm just exploring because that industry, especially in a car sales industry, it suffers a lot. There is a big lack of processes or lack of efficiency and yeah this is actually something that could be potentially my just a dream or lifetime project just to combine my technical expertise with with, uh, my passion nice that's that's where we want to be some passion but also yeah expertise that's really good to get into so a bit about so you went into obviously technology that's an area that you drove into programming i remember you did a bit of that in in the early days so your experience through the journey, where has that sort of started and then how did you end up in process improvement? The My whole experience started when I applied to uni. I was in Russia at that time. It was early 2000s and internet was still very, very new and not really accessible for the for, for majority of people. I didn't have a computer, obviously no. Well, I had a cell phone, I believe, by that time, just my first cell phone. Nothing else. I knew pretty much nothing about it. I spent, when I was a teenager, I spent a couple of times, a couple of days in my mom's office just exploring Windows 95, 98. I cannot remember what (laughs) what it was. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. This is all I knew about the whole technology industry. Mm -hmm. I started starting there. It was because it's math driven mainly. This is why I like it because I'm pretty good at numbers and my career started uh, it was a kickstart uh, I started with a national Russian development warehouse and we started to work straight away in massive projects mm-hmm. with the government departments and this is what I, I started as a software developer but at the same time in Russia when you're in tech 20 years ago you had to be a universal soldier So you are a networking engineer, you are a DBA, you're a software developer, you're a software architect, you do everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. So and this is how it all turned out. So I just started to work. It was just practice, 
practice, practice, practice. A little bit of knowledge from uni. Most of the things I acquired from, from the experience. It's definitely yeah. an area that we learn by doing, isn't it? It's not something you can read out of a textbook. It's it's by experience. Yeah, it is. It is a, as an industry that you need to get your pull your sleeves up and get right into to get learning and understanding and then pulling the big pieces together because it is technology can be done great if you learn the best ways to do things, develop them, the systems, the process, but also you can deliver crappy technology too if you don't know what you're doing. So it is a good learning environment to get into and then learn about what the best processes are to get really good tech out the other end. So um, And that process of doing a bit of everything is similar to what we did when we started Aerion. Basically, yeah. yeah. A handful of us and yeah, we all had to be able to do everything. Otherwise, yes. we didn't have anyone that could do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so that doesn't change over time. You still got your teeth in a few different things, right? So it's interesting. So concept angle. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and why you went down that angle around a consulting business for process improvement. Out of software, really, but uh, more about process. But they go hand in hand. So we'll let you talk through that. Yeah, sure. Well, I spent about... 18 years in mainly designing and building financial systems in different, different areas. So I started in Russia as with a software development warehouse, then I transitioned to the one of the largest uh, construction companies. Actually, in between the, those, I had two years in Russian army as network engineer. Yes. Then I joined the construction company where I just Blended to be the head of IT department of the local branch. Again, everything, just report, responsible for everything from the phone on the desk to the, all the software and uh, financial software accounting. Yeah, and then I moved to Australia and pretty much started from scratch my career. My first role in Australia was a graduate developer. Because okay. I came, yeah, I came... It, <laughs> After all that experience. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that's right. This, this was quite a, quite a challenge. Because when you come from the management position, it's very difficult to get back. But then I realized my English was very, very poor at that time. Even though I had been learning by that time it for 15 years, but I had been learning it in Russian and it was Russian English. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when I landed in Australia, I actually, my first question was, what did this? This is not English. Like to me, it was completely different. I couldn't understand. I barely could could understand anything. So, yeah, I started. I after a couple of months of searching for for the first role, I just scrubbed my whole resume and removed almost everything. Started as a graduate developer with a law firm and spent there about five years. I grew to technical team lead and left. So the corporate world, I realized the corporate world I had enough it was different. I just wanted something different because I was realizing at that time that I could apply my knowledge and experience wider than for one company. Mm-hmm. And corporate world, well, probably, you know, lots of people know corporate world is, is specific and it's... Sometimes it gets unbearable. And it has I, its challenges and hurdles and roadblocks and red tape and management and of management. So yeah, a lot of yeah. people in that, definitely. And I've been a rebel, not not crazy rebel, but I've been a rebel for, uh, for my whole time, uh, like whole, whole life. And in the corporate world, I felt just squeezed with the boundaries. Yeah, I decided to leave, leave technically to nowhere. I didn't establish anything but I had really good connections and we worked, uh, I kept working with law firms, with consultants, other consultants. And a couple of years ago, I came to realization that software development, software is a tool. And all I did all the time, the majority of time, maybe except first one or two years, it was process improvement because software by itself, the tool by itself, it doesn't improve anything. It allows and enables new processes. It makes things more efficient, but by itself, without changing the process, you know it probably better than me. Software worth absolutely nothing without change of the of the background of the way things go. Yeah, and the adoption, the willingness to use it, and the willingness to change it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, like I think you touched upon it there. Software is a tool. 
and that's all it is. And we can pluck a tool off a shelf and put it in a business, and most likely that will cause more havoc than it'll actually improve anything. So it requires a mindset shift, it requires education training, and even pulling apart your current processes because technology can maybe streamline certain things, automate certain things. So it's an important point that it is just a tool. It is not yep. the, the means to an end. Yep. A good example there is like you think of Photoshop, an artist can create some amazing piece of art in it and mm -hmm. we can change colors on the logo and someone sends us a file. Yeah, correct. <laughs> if, if the tool allows you to do the things, but you have to know how to do it and be willing to learn how to use it properly. Yeah, that's right. I, I like another comparison. I always compare the software with a hammer. You can destroy and you can build. It depends how you apply it. And with software, especially in business, there are lots of businesses who fall into the trap just being obsessed with technology and they chase shiny things with technology. And technology is a multiplier. And if there are issues in underlying processes, they just multiply issues and it actually starts working against the business rather than for business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there's a multiplication, if you have challenges, I think that's, a, that's an important point because you can, and in any context of business, if you multiply, for example, in a business that can't handle more business and you go and increase sales, the whole business will fall over. So you have to just think about it holistically, how it all operates together. It makes a lot of sense. Now, I'm looking over the back of your uh, your left shoulder, purpose, people, process, and technology. Talk to that a little bit. What does that mean to you and what's that all about? Well, this is the methodology we use and the order matters here. So it all starts from, from, from purpose because what I discovered in my personal development journey that purpose is the only intrinsic motivator that can drive people and uh, help to motivate and energize and makes you keep moving. So never give up. So the purpose is essential. I've got a couple of interesting examples of business, for example, that suddenly started to decline. And talking to the owner, we discovered that business that uh, they started about oh, 20, 20 odd years ago, who started to raise kids, and then realized the owner realized kids growing up, <laughs> kids kids left home. That's it. So the business completely lost its original. So it's not it didn't lose purpose. It accomplished it. So it just needed a new purpose, probably for the retirement, for the better retirement, for whatever, for grandkids. And this is where things started to shift again. So that's that's interesting how how it works because when you just run in business to make money, money is a goal. And if you call ATO and ask them what, what's the primary goal of the business, they will clearly tell you to make money. Yes, money is a good goal, but it cannot be a purpose. Money is a tool as well to achieve something else, to make a greater impact, to uh, impact. I'm talking about impact at different levels, personal level, family level, community around, global environment, whatever. So, yeah, this is number one thing that is required for sustainable business. I'll spin that back on you. So purpose is, is banded around quite a bit. So what's, from your perspective, what's your purpose? Because I think that's important to dig into here because we can all have our own purposes and why we do certain things. And why we started this podcast is to really give back to the community. It's a, it was a started as a passion project for us and really about helping people understand the challenges with building technology, especially being non-technical and what it might mean. And process is really an important topic because a lot of people that jump into this are usually, especially founders, they're really ideas people. They're more in the clouds. They're thinking about ideas from a big picture, but they don't get into detail. So when you talk about purpose for you, what drives you in terms of um, helping businesses improve their processes? That's a good question. I had been asking this question for, for quite a while in my life, and I discovered it not long ago, to be honest. Discovered and fully connected. My personal passion is to bring people, especially business owners, back home to their families, friends, hobbies, to their life by improving their business. So it is uh, closely tied up to my personal story from, from my childhood. I grew up in early 90s, were pretty harsh in Russia, so USSR just collapsed. 
Uh, it was a new country. There was lots of mess there. And uh, my dad passed away when I was five. So my mom had to work really hard. So she uh, worked two jobs just to put food on the table. And she left home very early in the morning and came back late at night. So I barely saw her. And obviously weekends she needed just her own recovery. And this is what uh, really drives me now. So because I believe that every human on this planet deserves well-balanced life and deserves to live the life rather than suffer at work and just trying to survive. So this is my primary driver. This is what I... Sometimes my friends laugh at me because I probably do more work than than I should be. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but yeah, it is what it is. I'm doing this. I'm really passionate about uh, making positive impact on people's lives. So in our consultancy, uh -huh. we like KPIs, profits, revenues, it's all secondary. The impact matters. Oh, that's, uh, thanks for sharing that story. So a question about your mom working two jobs, etc. What did that teach you? Well, I think it, my mom taught me to work hard, never give up and look after people around me. So I think these are the most important uh, lessons I got from her. Yeah, and I think, yeah, no, guiding but, principles. Yeah, definitely. So, and then I think the working hard is something that's pushed down in a lot of society, right? So, but I think we're here to work a bit smarter too, in some capacity. So, and helping people is the next thing on your list. So, what does people mean in the context of business, and how important do you see that for us? Our team is everything. Getting them involved in decision making has seen a profound impact on the way we operate. Getting them involved, not just for me and Anthony running everything, having them making decisions, being a part of the journey has really shifted the way we think about business. What does it mean to you in terms of when you're working with businesses around people? People, first of all, people in this methodology to make sure people aligned with the values, mm -hmm. people understand they are part of this team, they are doing. Actually, every team member understands and realizes that whatever they do, any of their activity contributes towards something bigger, something meaningful and purposeful. Okay. So it, it's, it is about the leadership. Mm -hmm. What do you find works well in, from a leadership perspective? Is it more that collaborative coach or is it the, someone from the top down just siphoning off, uh, this is what we need to do next? What seems to work well in business these days? I think coaching is the great model and probably the best model so far I've seen. Rather than management, it's a leadership. So it's a leading people, driving people, motivating people and coaching them. So coaching, coaching, and coaching, letting them grow because we are humans and the, our inner need of every person is to grow. So in some books you can find this is the need of the soul to constantly grow and develop. It is what it is. So we, we need to grow. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Henry Ford said the human dies when he or she stops learning doesn't matter whether they are 20 or 90. So we need to keep developing ourselves. I think, yeah, personal development's important. Even business development's important. And I think progress is probably the word I would look at. Yeah, learning progress, I find if we are continuously making progress and assessing things on progress and improvement, it, may, it feels you feel more content with what you're doing because there's no perfect answer. There's never perfect, and especially in business, it's always evolving and you're always stepping up to new levels. Teams evolving, everyone's evolving. As long as we're making progress, reflecting correctly, and then pushing forward, I think that's where I see growth in the business and within our people. That's true. And actually, this is very good connected to our biology because I, have, mm. I haven't officially started, uh, but I'm really curious about neuroscience and how our body, especially brain, works. Mm -hmm. And good thing you, you you mentioned that reflecting on the progress and this biologically, this is what we need. This just releases some hormones that makes us feel satisfied. And the same hormones 
responsible for the motivation. So mm -hmm. it's very closely linked on reflecting back. Yes, we need to stop between marathons, look back, celebrate, and then keep going. Because lots of businesses, what I found, run marathons one by one, mm -hmm. nonstop. And they, yeah, sprint, three month sprint. Yeah, quarter sprint, next quarter sprint. Where do you have a rest? You need that rest. It's we are not the machines. Yeah, like um, yeah, we can wear ourselves down pretty quickly if we just focus on getting things done. And I think yeah, we're not human doings, we're human beings. I think someone said that a long time ago. But yeah, so uh, I love that. To, yeah, we need to have time to reflect and just be sometimes and just appreciate what's around us. So people's important, culture's important. So we've got. So a business is working on, you've got, you've got your, your purpose, your people are aligned to that purpose, what your objectives are, process. Let's dig into now what we can do to actually understand our processes, maybe even document that out so we can look for gaps, look for challenges, look for bottlenecks, and then look to improve. What do we, what's an approach that we might take here? Well, the number one step is awareness. So you need to become aware of what's going on currently before changing anything. So the most important thing is to come to realization there is a process behind it. Some processes can be broken. Some processes can be pretty chaotic and messy, but it is imperative to just realize what it is, what's going on there from start to the end. And then once, the easiest way we are visual, 70% of people have dominant visual channel so once it's all visual in a flow charts whatever works there is no preference but this sticky is sticky notes on a whiteboard could be anything yes yes sticky notes that's best tool ever non-replaceable uh, the easiest to use uh -huh. yeah once it's all visual it becomes obvious where the roadblocks where the bottlenecks and as you've heard the awareness of the problem is a 50% of the solution. How do you help them become aware of the problem or the issues in their processes? So well, before they start documenting it out, how do you get them to think, all right, there is a problem here that we need to fix? The best way is to ask questions. And I don't need to tell people what their problems are. Just keep asking them. They, they have, every person have all the answers inside. You just need mm -hmm. to help to uncover them. That's it. People yeah. are, usually people uh, know what it is. Sometimes they hide this and do not let it go because sometimes it's challenging. We are humans and it's our psychology. If we made a mistake, it's okay to try to hide it and avoid it and not face it. But admitting it is, is a big step. It creates it creates energy shift, first of all. When you realize what's going on, it becomes easier. Yeah. So digging in on the, on the process front, awareness is big because you can put focus on problems. As soon as you, you, know, you see a flow and there's a bottleneck that comes up, okay, here's a challenge. We have one of these in our, businesses, our business right now that we've created that we're working on. But it's all about just bringing that awareness to front so you can put some focus and energy on it and begin to problem solve. I think it's easier to problem solve once you know what it is, what the challenges are. If you're, if you're in a place of unknown unknown, you're in, in big trouble. If you don't know what your problems are, it becomes difficult to work on them, right? And you might put your energy in the wrong areas and be, be looking back in our businesses. We've done this before, just assuming there's a problem here. But really, the underlying issue might be somewhere else in the process or in the stream of what we're up to. So I think it's important what you say, just draw it out, map it out, and just think about all the steps because you might be focusing here where it might be three down, three trees down that the real problem lies. Yeah, that's true. And one of the things that sometimes just need someone externally, someone to look from outside, not necessarily from the same industry with the same expertise, sometimes the clear mind works much better because it's very often we cannot see the forest behind the trees and we're all guilty and I'm guilty of that as well. Sometimes I cannot see the obvious problem within my environment, within my work environment, but I can easily pick it somewhere else for someone else. That's, yeah, this is how 
again, this is a blind spot. This is psychology and our biology, how, how it all works. And this is really where innovation sits. We're talking about business improvement, but this is anything. This is uh, building a new piece of technology or an ideating on a new piece of technology. Generally, it's improving a process for somebody. Any piece of technology is doing something new, efficient, differently, that's adding more value in a different way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be around a business. So in the world of in a startup or a startup idea or a concept, I know you work with predominantly small to medium tier businesses. If you're ideating on something, would you recommend still going through the same process around documenting processes, looking for opportunities within them? Yes, certainly, because this is awareness. This is first step that you cannot avoid. And until you, uh, you earlier you mentioned that when you know what the problem is, it's much easier yeah. to solve. When you don't know what the problem is, it is not possible to solve. It may be solved by the chance, mm -hmm. but it's like buying a lottery. So there is nothing depend on you. You can try and apply different things. You may hit the right point, yes. but unless you know what you are solving, it's mm -hmm. not possible to deliberately solve it. Mm. I think um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do within our business just to shed some light. So we basically once a month run a day with the team, which would focus on categories of areas of improvement. Top level, we look at these. And just drawing focus and attention to things actually allows us to think differently, evolve as a business. I think some people get too stuck in the day-to-day, -day, and we've, been, we've done that in the past, where you just, for a year or two, you're just doing the same thing. But customers don't want the same thing. Your people don't want to be doing the same thing. They want to see improvement. They want to see new challenges. They want to see new projects and opportunities, how we might do things better, how we might evolve as a business. That's made a big impact, just putting energy on what is working, what's not, and here's some categories that we know there's some challenges in. Let's just ideate around these. And I think um, bringing people along the journey has made a big difference for us. And it's got nothing to do with technology at this stage for us. It's more about internals or how we are operating. But within a technology business, we are bringing in technology pieces when it makes sense to us. And that's probably your last step on the piece of the puzzle, right? So technology is never first. And when people come to us around building product, building ideas, innovating within a business, they tend to jump straight into, we want to build this or we want to use this technology. Let's run with this. But I think it's about taking a step back and understanding what are you really trying to achieve here? What is the real value trying to add? Then we'll get to the technology. Yeah, you're absolutely right here. You need to get processes right first. You need to understand how things flow there. And then, yeah, again, technology is just a tool. It's not about the new hammer with a plastic or shiny handle. It is about the different type of hammer. Or maybe that's uh, a about hammer, like whatever. The pro processes matters. And technology, it is lots of businesses go with what technology offers, not what they need. And they limit themselves. So well done on having that monthly cash-ups. This is a great step and I'm pretty sure you are ahead of 80% of businesses overall who are just not doing this. And the most popular answer, I like uh, one of the questions that I ask very, very often. Why you do things this way? And the most mm -hmm. popular answer uh, because things always been this way. <laughs> this is the it's most answer, isn't it? this is the most dangerous and the saddest answer actually because people just go with the flow with the current they do they don't think how how it can change and also you mentioned in the previous question the term innovation i believe this term really scares people and it was massively overused in technology space mm -hmm. so any innovation directly associates with the, with the technology. So it's the digitalization, AI, there are lots of abbreviations and mm -hmm. terms from, from technology that scares people because it is unknown. And I look at innovation as just doing things better than yesterday. It doesn't matter with, with technology or without sticky notes. It's just to improve. It doesn't matter how. Yeah, it just needs to be something new. It doesn't yeah. have to be technology. Well, it can be something old, 
but yeah, better improve. than yeah, improved better, better than, than yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense because, and I think the answer to why we do why you've done things the way why you do things the way you do because we've always done them. That's a problem in a business. We should be questioning the way we operate because if we're not, someone else is. Um, and if we're not, someone else will be adding more value to the industry, to our customers, um, to the communities abroad, if they're answering those questions. Because uh, if we don't question the way we've done things in the past, there, there is no innovation. Innovation comes from someone asking a different question. That's what it is really. Yeah. That's right. Questions matter, and maybe you can see that's about four questions. Purpose is uh, why and where, so where you're going and why. Mm -hmm. Then next question is who? Who is walking the walk with you? How is the process and what is the tech? What, what helps you to get there? So, yeah, it's all about right questions. So when you get into technology, and this has come up in a few of our podcasts before. I think Anne Mills, I don't recall the number that <laughs> for podcasts, but she ended up going down the journey of just building some tech. And then that tech fell over by, and she realized that she didn't actually need tech. She needed to work out her processes first. So sometimes she spent a good year or two working out her processes because the, the tech fell over. She had a bad experience there, but her learning has been that even if that tech was built to a way that she wanted it back then, it still wouldn't have met the needs of her customer or of her business anyway because she didn't give it enough time to get the processes right. So I think we still want to be using pen and paper and documenting things in a roundabout way it can sometimes be a better means than jumping straight into the technology. I think um, picking something off the shelf is, is often an option for people. But if you're going to build technology, and if that's really the outcome, you really want to have your processes down pat before you jump into that, or at least you're on a journey to continuously evolve because yeah, you might build something that has no value to anybody in the end if you don't really do the homework up front. Yeah, it was episode 29, if you want to hear that journey. Yeah, yeah, it was an interesting journey, that one. Exactly. In my career, I've seen so many examples, where, especially when tech people start uh -huh. the business, they get obsessed mm. with their tech rather than with the market needs, like with the problem and solution, it's all coming with the tech and this is where it all falls apart. Yeah, focus too much on tech and you pretty much set yourself up for failure. It is a business model that you're establishing. It is an operation. It does have customers at the end of the journey and you're at, you need to be able to create value. And if you're, you're not answering a key problem, like you said, then what is your real value? other than yeah. a shiny object that people might try and then walk away from because there's no real added benefit to them. So, yeah, it's about how are we creating I, I would move customer to the first place in, the, in this chain because yes. unless you really understand customer's yeah. problem, not your own problem, yeah. which you mm -hmm. want to sell, customer's problem, then there is very low value in everything you do. <laughs> it's very true. So our purpose, when we go back to that, the top of the, the tree there, for me, purpose has to stem through, not just in my purpose, it's what is the purpose that we're delivering for our customers? What are we trying to achieve here for them, not for us? I find that purpose for somebody else drives me a bit more than purpose for myself. I think uh, I've read about this a number of times, doing something for someone else, um, we're more inclined to do that than ourselves. Sometimes we uh, yeah, can be a bit lenient on ourselves, but when we have a bigger picture and a bigger impact, that can drive us forward. So what would you say about purpose and where you should spend your energy from a purpose perspective? That's a good question. It is very individual for, for everyone. For some people, it is something really big and at the global level, it is making some good for the world, for the environment, for the society, maybe fighting or help, helping the inequalities, whatever. For some people, it may be just to take a good care of uh, their family and maybe families of their employees. This is a good purpose as well. If, if family is a number one value, it doesn't have to be big. And again, the purpose, there is a misconception in people's mind that a purposeful business is a charity. No, it is not. It's not known for profit. And uh, I believe more successful your business is, more impact you can, you can provide. So you can make, you, you can bring more good to this world. So it's not about being altruistic 
It's not about working for free and not about non-for-profits and charities. Oh, not, we can't make impact. And who donates to the non-for-profits and charities? The big businesses and people behind that, right? So we, in reality, yes, if you want to make a big impact, we still need to make a profit to be able to sustain that and look after the people that are in our culture and our customers in the right way. If you're not making a profit, you cannot serve your customers to the best of your ability because uh, you're always chasing the next customer to fill in that revenue stream and that doesn't serve anybody. That's true. You can't give until you have. Mm-hmm. Correct. Very, very, very good. So in summation, um, you're if I were to start the journey of process improvement or even looking at how I um, how I evolve my thinking within a business, within a startup, within a business that's operating, where do I start? What's my first step? What are a couple of key questions that might get me on the momentum to, to this uh, process improvement that we're talking about here? The number one step would be just take a break. Take a break. Yeah, <laughs> take, a, <laughs> take a break, make a step back to have a better point of view uh-huh. to have to to see uh, everything and i love to start i have uh, i use very simple model usually it's an arrow circle and square arrow is your marketing circle is your sales square is your operations and delivery so okay. and then start breaking down bit by bit until you have listed all the actions the simple actions that cannot be broken down anymore so that's very simple and the best question once you come to any action any pros why why we do this so first start to realize what is behind that process and sometimes you may find that some processes are really redundant you don't need them there is no reason for them you just keep doing them Interesting. But yeah, okay. <laughs> there is no value. Yes, some processes have really solid reasons behind them. Be it legislation, compliance rules, tech limitations. Like there are lots of documentation and compliance around that, and that that's okay. Some other processes they need to be questioned. Yeah, just to understand why. Why you, when you understand why you do things, and it is meaningful. For you, it's much easier to do them, even though they are routine and boring and repetitive. When person who is doing that knows why is that, it's much easier. Um, that's number one. Number two, who people who are doing that, who is responsible? What happens if this particular person who is, uh, especially for the processes who ran by one person? Mm-hmm. If that person wins a lottery tonight and flies to Hawaii tomorrow, what, what you would do? you do? Yeah, <laughs> do you have a back, backup plan? Who is a who is your backup? Uh, who knows the process? Where the process is? So it's about knowledge retention as well. So if the whole process sits in the mind of one person, there is a big risk. I had an interesting uh, experience a few years ago. I worked with a large U.S. company who was listed in uh, top 50 uh, employers in U.S. Massive company with uh, 17,000 staff around the world. Uh, They are one of their main processes, the billing process, was tied up to one person and not documented anywhere. So just one individual who's running it every month, just two days uh, during the month, generating all the bills for the entire company. This is really, really scary. It's Uh it's a golden person, so you cannot let go of this person. So there is no leave. There is no, like, if this person gets uh, sick, uh, or yeah, wins a lottery and just disappears. What happens? No one knows, and it's quite a complicated process for mm-hmm. for that large company. Interesting. Yeah, seventeen thousand employees. Position. So yeah, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> to think that that happens within such a big organization. Yeah. But if we get too fixated on the doing, I think yeah, we can get lost in yeah 
managing this stuff and even automating becomes a question how we automate certain things because um, there are certain processes that we do that are manual that can be automated if we do it the right way but we need to know our processes first what our outcomes are before we even think about automating them because to automate something without an understanding of what you're trying to get to is just pointless and a complete waste of time from my experience yeah. That's true. And sometimes you don't need to automate things. Sometimes you need to make them redundant. Mm. And not uh, not all issues or not all actions uh, deserve the good like tech solution or automation. Uh-huh. Some of them can be just changed or completely omitted. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's a fair point. How, on that note, um, what sort of how would you assess a process what do we do to say can we admit this can we automate it or should we redesign it what are we doing well the the first question why uh will give you most of the answers for for every question why why you do this what what value does it produce for you or for your customers Mm -hmm. and if there is more effort required to achieve this then it produces the value it's a questionable item Yes, there are some items like this that you cannot avoid, but just keep asking the question, why you do this? What resources, uh, what, what's the in- input, what's the output? So if there is a big mismatch in the value and there is no real reason, why you do it? <laughs> just because we're, just because. <laughs> it's yeah, because just, we've just always, because. always done this, Yuri. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, uh, Yuri, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to meet you and talk through uh, what is process improvement. It's definitely something that's important from a technology delivery standpoint. But like I said, we need to understand what the processes are before we can improve them, especially with technology. I think people jump head into technology and I think that's probably some of the biggest mistakes people do make. It's um, We need to really get clear on, I think, yeah, why is an important point here purpose what value we're trying to add to our customers what problems we're trying to solve who is it, who is actually a part of this process that the people it makes a lot of sense and it's pretty clear in terms of your steps in terms of doing this so um really want to thank you for being a part of the conversation today well how would people get in contact with you if they want to learn more about your business and what you have to offer well the website probably would be the best uh, point to have a look around so uh-huh. it's conceptangle.com.au Perfect. Uh, there is a scorecard, uh, a quick and free assessment tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, the new one is will be launched uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. I'm just finishing the business sustainability uh, scorecard. And uh, LinkedIn, I'm always open uh, to conversation and uh, glad to... Yes, really appreciate your time coming on and talking about processes and... I'll do that again because I think it just cut me before I started. Yuri, thanks for coming on. Really enjoyed uh, talking about processes and how we might improve them. Obviously, there is a bit to this understanding purpose, people, um, technology is generally last. Um, Some people like to jump into it first, but hopefully through this uh, experience, they'll learn that's probably the last piece of the puzzle. Uh, So if anyone wants to find out more about you, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, sure. The best place to have a look around would be the website, which is conceptangle.com.au. And more than welcome, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. I post uh, some tips there as well and love to connect and have a chat. It's Having a chat is free, so <laughs> I'm always open and I'm curious to meet new people, regardless of industry or whenever we can do something together. And I'm a big believer in a collaboration, so... I'm it is it is chat. an important point collaboration. Yeah. I think if businesses change, we need to collaborate as business owners within business, different industries, even competition can collaborate. So I think it's a really important point that you raised there. So once again, thanks Yuri for joining us. And if you liked um, the episode today, please like and subscribe in the links that will come along in terms of um, Spotify and everything. So really appreciate your time, Yuri. Thanks for joining thanks, us. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Yuri. Thanks, Anthony.